Everyone has heard of the Great Pyramids of Egypt. And while not as talked about, I'm sure some of you may have even heard of the Nubian Pyramids in present-day Sudan, just south of Egypt. But one other Sudanese marvel you may have never heard of before, though, is Jebel Barko. The mysterious Jebel Barko is a mesa or flat-top mountain in the north-central part of Sudan. This rocky mountain outcrop is outwardly more interesting to hikers or rock climbers than it is to historians or archaeologists. But upon closer inspection, we find ram statues and evidence of grand buildings, as well as the city's foundations long since weathered by wind and sand. This surrounding city's name was Napata. The city of Napata grew around Jebel Barko as it was sacred to the chief god of the Egyptian New Kingdom period, Amun, the creator of the universe. We might not be as overly familiar with Nubian or Kushite history in detail, but we will be covering some of the information that we do know about these fascinating people and their majestic site that we all know today as Jebel Barko. As previously mentioned, Jebel Barkal is a mountain outcrop that became revered as a site sacred to the god Amun, the patron of Thebes, and whose most famous temple he had dedicated to him was the Karnak Temple Complex in modern-day Luxor, Egypt. Around 1450 BC, the great warrior pharaoh Thutmose III of the 18th Egyptian dynasty invaded the region and captured the mountain as part of a wider policy of conquering Kush as a whole. The mountain was the southernmost point of the New Kingdom and is about 1,260 kilometers from the Great Temple of Amun at Karnak, located right on the bank or western side of the Nile River. It stands at an elevation of 104 meters from the ground and its cliffs are 80 to 90 meters above the river and 200 meters long. It rises starkly, a mountain in the middle of a sea of desert sand. It is also not far from the bend in the Nile, where the water there flows backwards. Additionally, Jebel Barkal has a natural spire, which rises to 75 meters. This spire inspired a number of interpretations. Examples include a snake and a feature of male anatomy, taken to be the procreative member of the creator himself. This confluence of the unusual led the Egyptians to believe that this must be a sacred place. In turn, the Egyptians, presumably because of the inverted flow of the Nile, assumed another symbolic inversion must take place, namely that of the East Bank life and Western Bank death symbolism derived from the rising and setting of the sun and the connection in the Egyptian theological imagination between the Nile and creation. Also, this was the southernmost point of the empire, and the Nile's source would be most southerly. As you may already know, the Nile River flows from south to north, so for Egyptians, the site of creation was seen to be the most southerly. This river was everything to the Egyptians, being seen as a source of food, agriculture, resources, transportation, and much more. The fact that the Nile is the southernmost point for the empire implies that Jebel Barkal is a site of creation, the birth of the creator. It is no wonder that the Egyptians gave the site the names Juwab, or Pure Mountain, and Nesetoi, Throne of the Two Lands. Here though, at the southernmost edge of the empire, far flung from most things, was the birthplace of the Egyptian pantheon, whose priesthood wrote the book on building theocratic power. So because of this, a temple needed to be built on the southern border. A big, beautiful temple. And the pharaoh was going to pay for it. And so he did. And as a result, a temple was built. Not an ostentatious temple like at Karnak, but still, a decent-sized one. It bore a large number of ram statues, which are a reference to a moon, a departure from his depiction in the art of the Theban clergy. British Egyptologist E. A. Wallace Budge describes the Temple of Jebel Barko as a large perpendicular mass of sandstone that has become separated by a deep fissure from the body of the mountain. And yes, as you can see, this is a wonder in Civ 6 as well, and a quote which is featured within the game itself. Definitely go play this if you get a chance. It is probably one of the best strategy games ever created. And no, we're unfortunately not being paid by the creators of Civilization, by the way. But hey, if you work for Firaxis Games and you're watching this video, please hit us up and we'll gladly team up with you so we can promote your wonderfully addictive historical turn-based strategy game. 
Anyways. For about 500 years, the pharaohs ruled and would travel down to Jebel Barkal in order to be ritually united with Amun, their father. A city grew around the holy pure mountain, with palaces and temples being erected all throughout the surrounding area. This city, as we previously mentioned, was called Napata. However, by the 20th dynasty, which was seated in the north of Egypt, and as the power of Amun's clergy grew out of hand, the pharaohs began to withdraw from the region. As a result, the connection with Karnak waned. The problem of the priesthood's power was not resolved and initiated the slow decline of the new kingdom into chaos. With the pharaohs no longer as interested in maintaining their southernmost outpost and losing patience with the interfering priests of Amun, the connection with the Egyptian branch of the priesthood seemingly ended, with the last evidence of a direct connection being the high priest Menkaper, who lived from 1045 to 992 BC. Now completely adrift, it seemed as if the priests of Amun at Napata became more interested in the local population and cultivated one of the local elite families to become their new patron. These Kushite elites seem to have embraced the Amunism of the Napata priesthood wholeheartedly. As you may recall, the site was used as a place to connect the pharaohs with their divine father, Amun. This, of course, would have great significance if the king of Napata was crowned at the throne of two lands, which he undoubtedly would be. It has not taken astute political scientists to imagine what would happen when or if the Napatan kings ever imagined themselves to be in a position to claim the title of pharaoh. With the king of heaven as your legitimate, who can stand in your way? Fortunately, we don't need a political scientist, as we have history as our guide. With the ongoing political disintegration in Egypt and invasions of the Assyrians, King Kashtar of Kush in 750 BC took advantage of the situation and invaded Upper Egypt, eventually conquering it. His successors Pierre and Shabatar would complete the conquest, reunifying Egypt under the 25th dynasty. This dynasty would be short-lived though, with the Assyrians pushing the Kushites out of Lower Egypt. Aside from this mishap, the Kushite pharaohs embraced Egyptian culture, their style of art and writing being derived from Egypt's, although they did have their own script. They built smaller pyramids as tombs for their kings. However, most importantly for us and the sake of this video, they seem to have emphasized their connection with Jebel Barkal. The crown they wore was a skullcap that was designed to make the head of the wearer look like Jebel Barkal itself. From an Egyptian point of view, this was an innovation, yet it emphasized the religious continuity between the peoples. One suspects that Napatan pharaohs did it to reflect where they thought their authority to rule Egypt came from, the god Amun of Jebel Barkal. But this was to represent a high point in the intertwined stories of Napata and Jebel Barkal. As the Kushites were pushed back by the Assyrians, they retreated to Napata. Then, the Egyptians sacked the city of Napata in 593 BC. Meanwhile, there was another major urban center blooming nearby, the city of Meroe. Slowly, the focus of power and the economy of the kingdom moved from Napata to Meroe. This shift can be seen in the building of the royal tombs, which were the so-called mini-pyramids that ended up being built in Meroe rather than Napata. But things would unfortunately continue to go downhill for the city of Napata. Again, another sacking of the city would take place in 23 BC, when the nearby Roman governor laid siege upon it. The city then seemed to have slowly declined in significance, with historians describing the succeeding period of Kushite history as Meroetic, reflecting that city's preeminence. The religious significance of Jebel Barkal in some ways continues to this day, with locals still revering the site. We have seen that the origins of this reverence was imported from Egypt and her religious preoccupations. In some ways, we have come to an account of how modern Sudanese customs came into being. Now, we might want to make the customs out to be a strange hangover of what was ultimately the cynical alignment of geography and politics rather than the sincere sense of the sacred, albeit perhaps misguided. If we want to read the history of Jebel Barkal as essentially Thutmose III and the priest at Karnak colluding to create a story of why the conquest of Kush was justified, we might wish to follow this pragmatic view. Alternatively, we may doubt this on the grounds that the custom has long survived after the political interests it was meant to serve had been extinguished. There has not been a pharaoh for 2,000 years, nor has the Temple of Karnak wielded any power since the Roman Empire officially became Christian. 
If anything, the interests have been removed and new interests, hostile to the worship of a moon, have become dominant. This would imply that Jebel Barkal is a genuine mystery, one that has inspired thousands of years of awe and wonder commanding respect down the ages, in thousands of people, drawing together cultures across time. It is a place of magnificence worth knowing about, and perhaps even seeing. Thank you for watching today's episode of Amateur Archaeology. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Also, comment down below on what you would like to see a video on in the near future. I know we mentioned a few interesting sites today, such as the Karnak Temple Complex in Luxor, Egypt, and the various Nubian pyramids that exist. Comment down below either Karnak or Nubian pyramids, and the most commented topic will get a video made on it in the near future. Also, remember to subscribe and smash the crap out of the bell so you can stay updated with our channel, as we'll be doing several giveaways in the future for authentic ancient coins. We'll see you all next time, only on Amateur Archaeology.